and welcome to American Public Square at Jewel. I'm Adam Erickson, membership coordinator for American Public Square and roving reporter for tonight's program. I'd like to start by thanking everyone who made this program possible, including the American Public Square Program Committee, the membership committee, and all the staff and volunteers at APS. Tonight, we will be speaking with political strategist and founder of Axiom Strategies, Jeff Rowe, who will be giving us his views on the Republican Party, how he thinks they should be handling these current crises, and what the future holds for the party. As always, during American Public Square programming, we uh, invite questions from the audience. Uh, as Rovin Reporter, I'll be watching for any of those questions you may have, so please feel free to type those into the chat. Uh, we will review them and ask those questions. Um, also, we are joined tonight by a co-host, Mike McShane, so please welcome him onto the program. With that, I will turn it over to Ambassador Alan Katz. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, welcome, Jeff. We appreciate having you here. And Mike, it's nice to have you as a co-host on this. Mike and I do a uh, podcast called Both Sides, and we've decided to expand his brief. He's going to get paid 10 times as much money as we pay him for doing the podcast. Uh, fortunately, he, we're not paying him anything for that. Uh, I wanted to, Before we start this, I just want to acknowledge the fact that we are dealing in a very fraught time in our uh, community and in our country. Uh, and remind people that the role of American Public Square is as a convener, not as an advocate, and our belief that people from different points of view, uh, we need to understand why they believe what they believe, how they got to that point, if we ever want to make any progress. And uh, tonight we have someone who has uh, been in the midst of the Republican Party uh, for a, a while, I don't want to say how long, but a long enough time that I noticed that the uh, uh, color in his beard is almost as gray as the color in mine. Uh, and, and, and Jeff, uh, I'd like you to start off this conversation by telling me, how do you describe the Republican Party today? What is it? Who is it? And uh, where do, what does it look like? There I got it. Sir, thanks for the introduction. And for the uh, the gray, you know, before Trump got elected, this was all brown, so that's all it's all brand new. Um, no, but I appreciate I appreciate what your organization does, and, and thanks for doing things like this. I know I uh, started paying attention to these when a a uh, former client of mine and friend Kevin Yoder were, was doing these with uh, Emmanuel Cleaver back in the day. So I, I'm proud to follow in such esteemed footsteps. Uh, the uh, the Republican Party today is a um it's the president's party like every party is in a presidential election and particularly i think we're 148 days in a wake up from election day so it's the, it's the president's party and he has as he tweets out very often <clears throat> he's got a 95 percent popularity with the republican base and it's almost like left-handed shortstops uh you know there aren't very many of them so you remember their names the people that are Republican and don't support him, you probably know their names because they're on MSNBC, which I have have tuned, you know, my favorite channel to watch news uh, this evening. I'm sure I'll see several, several never Trump Republicans on there tonight. Uh, but it's a it, base politics is really the culture of now. And, and a lot of people ascribe this, that the politicians make it that way, or Trump makes it that way, or Obama makes it that way. But the reality is, is voters follow uh, the voters and politicians follow the voters. The voters don't necessarily follow the politicians. And so what has happened in the last four years, but really for the, about the last 10 years, are every trend that exists in society has been accelerated and it's been accelerated again right now during a pandemic. And now, you know, all the events around the Floyd murder, that's all happening. In, in real time and voters are reacting and the politicians react to them. And so this is, a, this is the president's party. I think in the, in, the, in the Democrats, you see something, we're a very unified party, very unusual for Republicans to be unified. Uh, but, but Trump is, is stretching some of the limits of the Republican party and issues that they would typically have held very closely, whether it be on trade or other issues, he's really expanding the party. And I, I know in 2012, when we woke up on election night or woke up on election day, we thought there'd be no way that Barack Obama was going to get reelected and Mitt Romney was going to take him to the cleaners. 
And of course, Obama got over 300 electoral votes. And so they commissioned a study. How do you grow the Republican Party? And, we, and, and the, essentially the, the, uh, the, the main research document said that you grow with, with um, minority groups, you grow in different regions of the country. If you hear that background, I have a two-year-old Rocky who lives up to his name every day uh, and, uh, and, and two daughters, Reming, just, to, just to qualify my Republican credentials, my daughter, my six-year-old's name is Remington and my second daughter is Reagan and then I have Rockwell, who goes by Rocky. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of trying to earn my stripes. But, but when we see the president's party, and that's what the Republican Party is, and the Republican Party will be whoever our president is 20 years from now, and the, what you see with Democrats is this, this, this back and forth, is it a Biden party or is it a Bernie party? And it's probably an answer of somewhere between the two, but the Republicans are very unified we're very supportive of the president, and you know that's why you see the numbers that you have in our party. That's how I describe it. So I'd be interested. And by the way, I was told that this was uh, cocktails and conversation. So I hope everyone else has one. Okay, good. So no one can feel feel bad. I hope folks joining from home. I've got a, a delicious. This is a Green Spot whiskey from Middleton County Cork. So to all of you who are watching, to your health. Um, take a sip here. I started at noon just to be ready. By the way, outstanding. Got to start sometime. Uh, so. When you talk about the Republican Party, putting my like political scientist hat on for for a moment, traditionally, the Republican Party has been seen as an ideological party, while the Democratic Party has been seen as a coalitional party, right? So the things that necessarily united a teamster with an environmentalist was because the, the Democratic Party put these coalitions together and the sort of everyone got something that they wanted out of, uh, out of legislation. Whereas, you know, the Republicans, you think contract with America, you think this to be a Republican is to believe these 10 or 15 things that we want government to do. Now, it seems to me that we're actually seeing a reverse now where the democratic party is becoming more ideological. You have to hew to these six or seven things. Otherwise you could become persona non grata. Whereas the Republican party is being a little bit more flexible. You've got the federalist types that like their judges. You have the pro-life folks. You have, I mean, all of these, you have the trade hawks. You have all these people that are coming together. Is that the right read of the kind of lay of the land? And if so, what does that mean for our politics to see that inversion take place? Yeah, it's a great point, and it's and it's well founded, and it, it's backed by a lot of data that suggests the same. We have a, um, I think th I think you've got to from a first of all, we'll find out what happens on election day, and so you'll what you'll have, I anticipate. Well, we can see pretty clearly at least one side of the ledger here. What you actually have is any president that runs for re-election, they run a base campaign. If they haven't convinced you know, the middle, if you will, of the electorate to vote for them in four years of being the commander in chief, they're probably not going to do it during a couple hundred day campaign. So what you actually see is intensifying of each side's base. And that's one of Biden's problems, by the way. Biden, if you look at these election results, they don't talk about it, of course, they being my friends in the press, but the reality is he underperforms in major cities, even today. There's, there's, you know, the, we've had about a dozen elections since he's been the been the, the essentially the presumptive nominee, and he underperforms in every major city. In Portland, he runs eight points behind the statewide share that he gets. He gets fifty eight percent in Portland, and he gets sixty eight percent in the balance of the state. In Cincinnati, he runs six points behind. I mean, you just go state by state by state. It's all across the board. He does worse in in, in metropolitan areas in his own party. You also see numbers coming out, even the NBC Wall Street Journal poll today that showed that, that Trump had um, higher than ever, not maybe ever recorded, but very high numbers about Af African-Americans and Hispanics just in the last NBC poll. So you see this, when you talk about a base campaign and a base energetic approach, it's, it shows that the Democrats are really still trying to figure out where they are electorally. Are they a base? ideological, give no ground, defund the police, and all the things that you hear about, which Biden just rejected that call today, in a way. Uh, what, kind of camp, what kind of campaign are they and what kind of party are they? And I think that's, that's, he has to win to really sort that out. 
We have primaries, what used to be the Tea Party, you know, folks would take on the establishment folks. We still have that, of course. But you see that more on the Democrat side now with the AOC and the, and the progressives challenging long term. In fact, just picking off a Republican or a Democrat in a primary, Lipinski in, in Illinois just the other night. So you really see that that kind of fracture of what type of Democrat party do they have? And that's a problem for them going into the election when you, if you have any sort of underperformance. You've got to think about the structure of the partisanship, too. And, and this is just numbers. I'm not making value judgments on this. But Republicans... Uh, is effectively in a, in a national campaign, they need to get about 65% of 65%. They need to get about 65% of the white turnout, which is about 65% of the country. And Democrats have to get about 85% of 35%. And that, that equals a, a narrow advantage for the Democrats across the country, which is why we lose popular votes all the time. But because of the because of the layout of the electoral map, it, it gives Republicans a fighting chance. And so when you think about that, if you have to get 85% of a vote, I mean, just that alone, we've got to get 65% of white votes. Boy, that really draws people to the edges because you've really got, it's not as much about when you got, even if you're talking about 135 million people, let's say it's 140 million people vote this time, or even 150 million you really actually don't care about the percentages as much as you care about turning out 75 million people. Yeah. And when you have that, and when, when people in a, an election, and I subscribe to the theory, by the way, of base elections, I believe this vanishing middle, which used to be huge, it used to be, you know, 40% on one side and 40 on the other, and this big 20 that everybody was trying to get to. Well, now that middle is about four. It's not 40. On a big day, it's six or seven. And you can take a look even at just polls coming out now, real time, in one of the toughest times electorally for the president. And he's still in, in, in uh, spitting range in Wisconsin. He's still, you know, he lags in Michigan. But Pennsylvania and places that we've not won elections forever, he's still within the margin of error in what you would think would be the worst time uh, in one of his worst times in his presidency. So as he's... As the part, as the Democrats determine who they are, they determine in a way by nominating Biden. Biden has a camp of people that are the old Biden folks that are all centrist Democrats. He has a whole new, including his campaign manager and his now deputy campaign manager, they're all base, I ran campaigns against these people, they're base electoral folks. So he's gonna have this struggle and this turmoil and it's gonna be determined what kind of campaign he runs. If you run, a middle campaign against a base candidate, you lose. I mean, it's just what it is. Romney was trying to get Democrats picked off. And, and Obama, we never saw a single ad uh, in Missouri because he wasn't trying to get any of our votes. He was trying, he just left the state that had been a bellwether state for 100 years and went to maximize his votes in, in Philadelphia and, and the swing states that they had identified. And so as you run these campaigns, where it really comes down to about seven counties in the country that determine these elections, and as of last time, you know, less than 100,000 votes, 77,867, I think. Well, then you, it just really makes the requirement for a political campaign to ascribe to the edges, which is counterculture to what we're trying to do here tonight. But it, it makes people go to the edges instead of to the middle. And I think the Democrats are going to, they're going to have a decision to make. Hillary Clinton was trying to run, win Republicans, if we recall last time, for a mandate. She was actually advertising to Republicans to cross over and vote for her. And uh, when she should have been worried about not picking Tim Kaine, but picking Cory Booker last time. So this is a struggle, that's why campaigns matter, and that's why the next 150 days are gonna be very, very important to determine that, because if Biden wins, then they'll make a decision, really as a centrist, unless he changes all of his positions. There'll be a big, big decision that he makes for his VP, there'll be his first kind of big decision as a nominee. And so I think we'll see some of these things play out. Is it, is it a base party or is it a, is it a collection of, uh, you know, the big Democrat coalition? I think, let me ask a question about that, Jeff, because I yeah. think the, the Democratic perspective would be that, uh, uh, that that decision was made when they nominated Joe Biden. And that uh, I was reading an article the other day on how Bernie Sanders is, quote, a, to everyone's surprise, has been a team player in a variety of different ways. So that, so I think that my question really, though, is this. Don't you think that this presidential election, well, let me back up. 
if you're an incumbent, you want it to be a choice election. You want basically people to sort of, uh, it would seem to me that's certainly what Obama wanted it to be in 2012, and I think Bush wanted it to be in 2004. Uh, I'm not sure that this president is capable of it being anything but a referendum on him. And if it is, it would seem to me that that's the worst possible place for him to be. Because as you say, things are baked in. Now, I would agree with you. I would say 95% is baked in at this stage of the game. So there's really very little left except turning out your, each side turning out their people. And I think that uh, the poll, polls right now are not, trending the president's way. And when you're down by 21 points with women, it's kind of hard to make it up. So anyway, I'd like, now that I've given you all that to play with here, I'm tossing you the ball, go ahead and sort of bat it around. That was a statement carefully wrapped in a question, right? Um, so the, uh, <laughs> a little chin music, just kind of loosen everybody up. Um, so this is what I would say. If you said, uh, if you had told me 90 days ago that we were gonna see a pandemic like we've not seen in 100 years, a great depression like we've not seen in 90 years and civil and racial unrest like we haven't seen in 50 years regard. And that was all, that was all going to happen in one year. And it was all going to happen within 220 days of the presidential election, whoever the nominee would be in bad shape. It wouldn't matter who the nominee, by the way, these things all, not those things because it's so stark, but we had, you know, uh, police shootings, you know, during Obama, with Obama, Biden, I mean, things we don't control, you know, the, the timing of these things. But if you take those three things, wrap them up in 190 and 50 years of, of their occurrences and put it in one election cycle within 200 days of a presidential campaign, it's, it's going to cause a problem for the incumbent. The second thing that's going to cause a problem for the incumbent, a Republican incumbent, is that every year, uh, every, this point in every election since 2000, the Democrats have been ahead. And the, John Kerry was ahead at this point. And so Democrats typically have an advantage. I can go into methodology on polling on they don't call registered voters for whatever reason. I don't understand that. I wish they just stopped doing that. But, but if, you, if you count every single uh, registered voter poll, John Kerry was winning. Every, every Democrat's winning this time in the, in the campaign because the choice is not clear and the choice is not firm. And big presidential campaigns sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, get resolved on somewhat tedious issues. Whether you're gonna have a lockbox for social security or not was 2000, I mean, for a year and a half, we talked about a lockbox for social security, what a kind of joke that is. So this though <clears throat> is a very heavy direction of the country election. Over 91% of people believe that this will be the most important election of their lifetime. And we always say that as political consultants and politicians, it's always the big one and all. I think they actually might be right. Now, if I think if we got Bernie Sanders or somebody else instead of Biden, it would have maybe a little more emphasis behind it. But I think it probably is a big moment for that. The current polling, again, I don't, if, it, if just for any, you know, listeners that we have or, or viewers, I guess, um, if you look at a survey and it doesn't say likely voters, just, you know, take it for what it's worth, which is not much. And if you call, if you literally are calling um, just the population, you can just throw that out because about 65% of the people vote. But if you take a look at the real polls, and then if you look at a national survey, we're probably likely to lose the popular vote again, like most Republicans do. Two or three points is probably the number. It's the number today. You know, maybe I think the real clear politics average, which if you take out the registered voters, it's about 4.4%. But you've really got to look at those state by state polls and where, and where those, what, that's where the election and that's where the action happens. And advertising and marketing works. And so a, can, a presidential candidate gets to make a decision and if they're going to have a referendum or not. Trump gets a vote on that. And he doesn't, get, he doesn't have to say, are you better off four years ago than you were today? It's, are you better off four months ago than you, you know, are you better off today than you were four months ago? And so even today, again, this is a very tough day for me to be doing a, this type of, of, uh, of project because this is a tough day. But even today in the Wall Street Journal survey, he wins by 11 points on voters that make the economy their number one issue. Now, Republicans always used to lose among economic issues because most Republicans, Republican households have higher incomes, 
Republicans have lower unemployment rates. But now when you're talking about 13 to 14% unemployment, when you talk about the market just finally climbed back to where they're only down 1%, the central question of the campaign today, and it could change a hundred times between now and election day, by the way, but today it, it is who is best to rebuild the economy. And even when I think really hard about it, and even when I put you know my, my whiskey down and, and think big thoughts about, if I'm a Democrat, what am I gonna talk about? There is no economic message from Biden. And I mean none, I can't even, I can't even dream of one. He said he wanted to raise taxes on the rich. That's kind of a staple of any Democrat campaign, but no specifics. Now, it also means we're not gonna debate these kind of more narrow issues. We're not going to be debating bump stocks and, and Green New Deal as much. But I mean, these are big, heavy, weighty issues. And voters really don't need to be told that they're going to be making a decision on who's going to lead us out of it. They've already decided that it's a big election in historic numbers. Normally that numbers, I didn't set that up very well. Normally that number's in the 40s or 50s percent that think it's the biggest election of their lifetime. And they're typically right as well. Whether Al Gore won or whether the George W. Bush won, that had big impact and big consequences, but they were closer in the ideological spectrum than what we have today. And so voters already make that decision as they take a, take a look at these candidates in these states that are critical, they're making a choice. I mean, that is a flat out choice because the issues are so big. What direction we want to go? And Biden, who, if you, if you would put him on a, on a scatter chart with Trump over their, both of their 75 years, they'd probably been you know, Biden's probably been more in the center or to the right than Trump was for most of his life. But in the four years of his presidency, he has built the Republican Party in a passionate, fighting brand way. And Biden, since he's launched his campaign, and I think they, you say they made that decision, I think they kind of had it made, made for them. He wins one state, seven people endorse him in 96 hours and the election's over. And he's still getting 65% in the cities. 55% in some instances, but there's still a big choice to make. And also the thing I would say why this is such a difficult time for the president, in addition to the pandemic, in addition to the economy, in addition to the racial and civil unrest, it's also a place that Joe Biden has made five public events. And before this pandemic started, we did a series of focus groups over seven, we had nine focus groups in seven states. And the word cloud at that moment which is right at the time when this was all starting to unfold and, and we, we, because we did it over a period of days, he had won for half our focus groups. He had won South Carolina, it was consolidating. We were polling no men, no Republicans, uh, soft and centrist and soft Republicans, soft Democrats, soft Republicans and, and independent, all women. There was one phrase and we would just ask the presidential because we were more interested in the, you know, the political terrain of the local state. But well, we'd ask the presidential because you've got people in there in a political focus group. You ask political questions. All of them, the word was, and boy, some of your folks are not going to like this answer, but I'm just repeating the data. This is just what it said. The word cloud coming out of those focus groups was he's lost a step. That Joe Biden has lost a step. Now, if you have to take on big weighty issues, if you don't have an economic message, if you actually at some point in this campaign will have to go campaign, you'll have to pick a VP, you'll have to do something with your convention. There's a lot of room for this to be a big choice election. So do you think we're going to have um, conventions this summer? And uh, if we don't, this is maybe, I have, I am starting to get a little bit gray in my beard, but as the, the resident uh, young person on the call, to me, uh, conventions seem like a complete anachronism, like back from the day when, you know, you couldn't trust someone to relay a telegram to you. So you had to speak in person and now, with phones and emails, any deals that need to be cut or things that need to be done can be done over that. So do you think we're going to have conventions? And if they go the way of the dinosaurs, is it that big of a deal? So it's a good question. This is the way I measure it. And so I think you're probably right, um, except that I measure this in earned media. Presidential elections, they'll both raise a billion bucks probably. Maybe Biden gets to 600 and 700 or something, but they'll be about... Trump will raise probably north of a billion and um, Trump and his associates will raise a billion and Obama or sorry, Biden and his and affiliate groups will probably raise 750 or 800, depending on what a few of the billionaires, you know, what's a hundred million between friends. So they'll, they'll, it'll be competitive in that way. But just think in, in the month of October in 2016, 
there was $2.2 billion of free advertising that the presidential campaigns garnered. You take a look at the conventions and they're about $250 million worth of free advertising over those few days. So anytime you have that, while most people are just carrying on their day and doing what they're doing, when you really take a look at the earned media impact and the free media that you get, not the cable shows. I mean, the cable doesn't count. I mean, literally, there's 20 million people watching CBS Nightly News, which I think is ranked third. Nora O'Donnell, I think, is the host. She's getting, I mean, these guys are getting 20 million people watching. Historically, pre-pandemic, they were down to seven or eight million. By the way, that seven or eight million is more than all the cable shows combined. And that was a third rated show, let alone NBC and Lester Holt. So when you talk about that much coverage, that much penetration, that much news of the day, boy, that's a lot of money to say that they're not worth it anymore. So I'm not, I'm not quite where you are. I think from the kind of pragmatic, they get around there and hoop hop and throw their hats in the air and act funky and dress up as Abraham Lincoln or whoever the Democrats dress up as, I guess Harry Truman. But really, when you're talking about that kind of level of depth of penetration of, and saturation from media, 250 million isn't something to sneeze at. So I think we'll have something, what it looks like and how many locations and all that kind of stuff, who knows. But I think they're going to have to do something to maximize that week. Okay, let me add, let's go to our uh, roving report. I think you got a few questions, Adam. Don't you want to start with one? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And yeah, just to remind all of our viewers, um, you can – ask a question in the Q&A section, or if you're watching through Facebook Live, you can post it directly on our Facebook Live page. Um, okay, Jeff, we had a question. Uh, you were talking, I mean, you talked a lot about how the it, it, this isn't gonna be a, an election with narrow topics like bump stocks or something. And you also mentioned how, you know, every party is kind of the party of the president. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that, you know, the Republican party under Trump is not necessarily the same as it was under different, you know, previous Republican presidents. So what then do you think is the Republicans kind of vision for America? What, what do they want? What are they, what are they trying to get or, or say, I guess? The Trump, I'm sorry, the Trump, uh, the Trump voters? I know. So I would say just Republicans right now, I guess that's quite, could be voters and maybe the party itself. What is their vision for America moving forward? Yeah, well, there's a, um, I shouldn't start at noon. This would be, this is, I, I probably wouldn't say this in front of a bunch of people. I can't see their faces, but. There's a, the Republican Party is, is um, on the right, post-Vietnam War, the, the word of the Republican Party is freedom. And um, the word of the Democrat Party post-Vietnam is equality. And so where you fall on that, on that arc determines your political leanings. If you take it to the furthest extremes and the Republican and the far right edge, edge of the political universe believes complete autonomy, complete freedom, Everybody go out and make their own way. You know, we don't need taxes. We don't need anything. We need a road. We'll privatize it and build it. You know, that edge. And then on the Democrat edge, the equality, everybody gets 20 acres and a, and a mule and, and the government will take care of everybody. Where you fall on that determines on where you are. And so what Trump has done, again, for the first time, is the most popular Republican with Republicans in history. It's hard to process that. In life or death, he's more popular. No one's ever had these numbers is he's completely unified the center to the right of freedom without, again, with that besides left-handed shortstops, without exception. Now he's brought people that are Democrats into the fold and we understandingly and knowingly have lost some people that were on this side, he's lost them too. And he maybe has made them Democrats, maybe forever. We've had highly educated suburban women leave the party and it was, you know, quote, is a woman problem. X, Y, and Z, there'll be a lot of analysis about that afterwards. But the, the great debate about the Republican Party is who to, how to grow the party. You get people that haven't participated before, that listen to, as odd as, odd as, as it sounds, a billionaire from Manhattan, to tell us what a, a, a common sense guy is going to say to his buddy sitting in the bar. And that's what he's brought together. And so they really just want less government they want less wars, and if he gets reelected, it will realign the party for sure. We're due for a realignment, by the way. We realigned under Reagan. About every 40 years it happens in politics. Reagan in 80, Trump in 20. You could argue FDR prior to, to Reagan, a Lincoln, Lincoln 80 years before that, Jackson 40 years prior to Lincoln, Washington 40 years before that. I mean, we have realignments all the time in, in politics and in our parties. And if our parties aren't breathing and, and 
and growing and, and contracting and, you know, testing the elasticity of it, then they're probably going to die anyway. And that's why parties are really founded is the growth of it. But we have an America first agenda, which is much less interventionist nationally and interna- I'm sorry, internationally. That's new. That's much, that resembles much more of Carter than it does, than it does Reagan or Bush for sure. It, the trade, we, we, don't, we, we no longer, as Republicans, we will pay more for it to be built here. All of our China, all of our medication, all of our clothes, try and find an article of clothing not made in China. We, the, the Republicans will pay more for it to be made here, which has some big Democrat constituencies that that, that, that appeals to. So I think if he gets reelected, I mean, that's going to be the realignment of the party. Whether the Republicans stand for, they stand for freedom. And they stand for more protection here than, than what we spend overseas or what we spend militarily overseas. And so that's a, that's a big change in the last four years. Okay, Jeff, let me just sort of, uh, let me pick up on that point. And it's one of your earlier ones. You talk about he is, his numbers among Republicans are unprecedentedly high in terms of support but not so much in terms of when the, when, the, when the election comes around, in terms of the fact that most Republican, most candidates, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you better get 90 plus percent of the people in your party to vote for you because you still have a, a big chunk in the middle that are not registered Democrats, registered Republicans. But what we do know that, that he has lost is he's lost uh, college educated women in the suburbs. We know that he is, actually the numbers on Hispanics from the latest poll look better that he performed in 2016. So we'll see where that goes. But I think it's really, but the, but the larger question seems for the Republicans is this. The Republican Party presidential candidate with the exception of 2004 has not won a majority since 1988. <clears throat> if I'm wrong there, but I think I'm right. And I realize the electoral college has sort of been sort of a, a way to winnow way through uh, Bush in 2000 and Trump in 2016. But the reality is, is that at a certain point in time, as you know, if you're losing, if you lose by four or five points, it's very difficult to win the Electoral College. So where do the Republicans go from here, other than maybe hanging on, trying to hang on this time with the Trump-like message? So, well, first of all, I don't know. So the growth and the migration has impacted those numbers. But if you take out L.A., New York, and Houston, it's a tied election, literally tied. Now, you can't take out three of our four biggest cities. But when you talk about the migration, they move those central, we've centralized and people have moved to big urban and suburban areas in droves. And so I don't, I don't actually agree because I think that a big chunk of the, of the Trump party, I imagine Romney last time when he got flogged. And I'm not jumping on Romney because I mean, I'm not as anti-Romney as you know, the president is, but he would have gotten flogged against Hillary Clinton. The reason why is because he would never have Pennsylvania in play, ever. And even today, after three years of Trump, a populist, blue-collar message that the Republican Party has never had. Here's what's happened. And, and you can track this. I mean, this, again, this isn't, man, I wish I could make up, you know, make up my own way of the world and everybody kind of comport to it. But I'm just reacting to data. You take a look at previously, we used to get, we being Republicans, used to get people that made $100,000 to $250,000, and that was our bread and butter, man. I mean, it's like in the 80s. And Democrats had everybody from about 35000 below. These are family households incomes. Trump has brought that down $15,000. He now has a chance. Trump breaks even or even wins in these populous blue-collar states, Midwestern states, and industrial corridor states, he wins them now when no one has won them since, you know, you guys put a, put a guy in a helmet, you know, riding around in a political ad in a tank. So, I mean, that populist message is just different. By the way, populist and blue collar doesn't work in L.A. And it doesn't work in New York. And it doesn't work in my new, you know, adopted hometown of Houston. It just doesn't work there. I mean, they're suburban. They're Ubering. They're you know, door dashing their food at night and they're it's just a different life. I mean, I'm living a different life than I did when I lived in Brookfield, Missouri, which Brookfield, Missouri in Lynn County, Missouri is like, it used to be like a swing county. Sullivan County to the north was a little bit more Democrat than you had Unionville, <laughs> pretty Republican, one of the most Republican states of the, or counties in the state. Putnam County, Unionville is the center of it. 
So with that realignment, Lynn County is now like a 65%, 70% Republican seat. Everybody in the courthouse is Republican now. That is a accelerated trend of coastal, coastal strength among Democrat voters. And that will only grow, but there's only so many places that are that urbanized, that educated. And what we gave up to get the $20,000 blue collar voter, the 25,000 against family household income, what we gave up is we gave up people making hundred grand. We've given them up, but that is a trade. By the way, if you're just a political scientist and nothing else, and you get to move these things around like, you know, armies on a risk board, you would actually make that, you would make that trade because those people live in the places where we can still win and we're not going to win New York and we're not going to win uh, California. Now, similarly, you see this coming in, you know, you see this, these trends being accelerated where the old kind of geographical platelets that we used to think about electorally, <clears throat> we used to think about Missouri, literally Missouri used to be a bellwether. Trump won it by 19 points. That's not been that long ago. That was, you know, John McCain won, won Missouri by 4,000 votes over a month. Like, that's not been that long ago. And now it's a 19 plus state. Right. I don't know. And I think, and I think we're going to, and then I'm going to get to another question from, from yeah. one of our audience, but uh, I just want to say that, you know, what we're going to find out is whether, or now things in Arizona and Texas have changed as well. No, they have. Well, and Georgia. So yeah, go we ahead. Know Adam, you got a question for us, and then Mike, you're up next, okay? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, one of our viewers wants to know, if Trump loses in, in, in this election, do you think that he will kind of consider to be a part of the party, maybe a figurehead from the outside, or does he kind of move away? And then kind of the follow-up to that is, do you think that there will be like a Trump heir, whether that's literally somebody in the same bloodline or maybe someone who just kind of ideologically or however you want to say it follows? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for uh, that. Um, I gave up on being a psychologist on Trump a long time ago. I did run a campaign against him, I think, besides Robbie Mook, longer than anybody else in America has. So I've studied him quite closely and uh, became a natural supporter after he cleaned our clock in Indiana. Uh, I ran Ted Cruz's campaign. We dropped out after Indiana. Um, yeah, I think it's probably, if he loses, I think it's probably, you know, it's really hard to tell. Don Jr., Ivanka, very political, very savvy. Um, you know, I've seen surveys in Iowa that have Don Jr. beating Mike Pence for president in Iowa. So, you know, there's going to be, I think there's going to be three kind of characteristics of a Republican electorate in the future, at least in the shadow of Trump. And I don't know how long that shadow will, will go or how long he'll carry it. But there'll be three questions. One, who's the most electable? Two, who is most Trump, who most likely to carry on the Trump legacy? And number three, and these are all third, 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 oddly enough, a third who can win, a third who's going to carry the banner the most effectively and a third who's the most conservative. So I think that's our kind of reshaped party and what that looks like. Again, extraordinary turnout, big turnout even, you know, in Republican primary states when there's no primary going on. So I think, uh, I think that's going to be the conditions. I think that Trump wouldn't be, able to, wouldn't be able to contain himself but to be active politically. Now, whether it's a feature, if he lost, you know, I don't think he's going to, you know, lick his chops and go home and disappear, you know, going up the escalator. So I think he'll be heavily involved. And I think the institution of this new type of Republican will be, will have some staying power as well. So I'm interested since you brought up the last campaign, I didn't want to put any uh, salt in the wound, but since you opened the door, I'm going to walk through it. Oh yeah. I'm not, well, I'll never get over it. It's okay. Well, so I, again, this one, I'm not really trying to twist the knife on you here, but to prepare for our conversation this evening, I went back and read through um, Tim Alberta's book, um, American Carnage, uh, that, that, that spoke a fair, fair bit about the campaign. And I think, you know, a fair number of, of our viewers, well, first off, he has these stories and I can now have you either confirm or deny them, which is great. Um, but I think some of our viewers might not know, you know, there were efforts by the Cruz campaign to, to knock Donald Trump out of this. The first one that he reports is a sort of unity ticket with Mark Rubio that fell apart in kind of crazy circumstances. Then there was a kind of last minute meeting with John Kasich, who refuses to drop out, yep. only then choosing to drop out was it the day after Senator Cruz okay. dropped out. Yep. Yeah. So are, is there like an 
alternate universe in which one or the one or either of those things does actually end up happening that case it drops out before or that this unity ticket is put together and we're actually having a president cruz right now instead of a president trump and if that's the case would the world be different would we be talking about a different electorate would we be talking about a different republican party would we actually be seeing in all of these events that are playing out do you think the world would be different uh, so yes, both those things are true uh, that Tim wrote about, um, and uh, we had you know we were knocking on heaven's door with Rubio, but um, I think it's it was no staff involved from his side, and I think they found out and and scuttled the deal. Um, and Kasich, I mean, good lord, I can't. Yeah, he dropped out. I'm going all the way to Cleveland, boys. You can stay in or get out, but I'm going all the way to Cleveland, like you know, right in your eye. And he drops out, you know, effectively ten hours later. Um, so I think, you know, of course, whoever the president is going to have a big impact and a big imprint on all this kind of thing. And obviously, Cruz would be much more conventional of a Republican on, you know, on trade and, and, and uh, military and some of those things. Of, of course, uh, that'd be different. But, you know, at the same time, and that's a good friend, not just a client, a buddy, but a friend. But it's also, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult campaign. I mean, the, there's the states that we would need to put in play. The entire map would have looked different. We probably would not been have, would not been competing for Pennsylvania, but we probably would have gone after Virginia. We probably couldn't have competed in Michigan, but we would have been going after Colorado. I don't think the income levels, you know, they would have stayed higher and and not be able to. We, Ted's got a populist streak, but it's more libertarian populist. So yeah, of course, it'd be a different campaign and a different administration in some respects, but in other respects. I mean, you got to look at Ted's muscle memory in fighting Obama that he's turned into, hey, he's got a chance to actually do things now. And so big things that, in fact, we have joked along the lines that of our 10 things we would do on day one, Trump has done all 10. So, you know, that's what's actually endeared a lot of the folks that were maybe skeptical about what kind of Republican or what kind of conservative he would be. That's why everybody, that's why Cruz is one of his biggest champions in the Senate now because of that. So it would definitely look different. Um, but every presidential, you know, would, would create that same sort of dynamic. Okay. Uh, let's go to the, uh, our roving report. You got another question for us, Adam? Yeah. Uh, one of our audience members wants to know what, uh, is there anything Trump could do to lose the support of his base? And if so, you know, what, what is that or those things? Um, I don't see it. I mean, one of the reasons why, uh, why the president has such a, a lock on the party is because he fights back. And so a lot of the time, one of the, a lot of the things that we see him do, and he'll tweet about somebody who's like, I wish that it didn't happen that way. But it's the fact that he is a hundred percent of the time brand consistent. He's had this fighter, non-politically correct brand that he's, reinvested in every day, sometimes a couple hundred times a day, that everybody just knows that we are fighting. I mean, that's the way Republicans think about it. I, it's funny, I taught it at, at the University of Chicago. No offense, Jewel, I've also taught at Jewel. I actually did a, taught a whole semester there one time. And man, is that a tough job. So thank you professors for what you did. I thought I was gonna go get to tell war stories for a semester and I ended up doing a syllabus and told people they had to read Caro's book, you know, in, the, in my syllabus. And, about 13 people dropped out of my 20 person class and I had to kind of clean it up. So Jewel's a great, a great place. But I taught at the University of Chicago for a semester and a student came in and she sat down, they have office hours and they're packed in there. They come every 20 minutes, a new person coming in. And this girl walked in and she looked at me. She goes, you know, I just really wanted to just come to one of your office hours because I've never met a pro-life Republican. Can you tell me why you're pro-life? <laughs> so I'm like, you've never met one? This is like a petting zoo or what are we doing here? And she just really wanted to kind of hear me talk for 20 minutes about being pro-life. So I think that when we get into this, you know, fight that he feels like we feel like he undergoes every single day, even when he does something right, or even when it does something that, you know, most of the people agree with this fight that he's in and he's fighting back for everybody. And so I think that endearment would be pretty hard to shake. Okay. Let me just ask this question though. So let's, I mean, there, there are, uh, 
there are currently, or there have, there have been undercurrents of dissatisfaction with, with what I would call traditional old line Republicans simply because the policies that he has embraced are sort of contrary. And of course, some of them used to give lectures on um, uh, personal morality to Bill, about Bill Clinton. So that's sort of, but the, but the larger question is this, do you not see an attempt by whether it's the Marco Rubios of the world or the John Kasich's or whoever, that if Trump loses this election, an effort to sort of, if you will, take back the party. Don't, do you see that happening or do you think that that's just a fool's errand? Yeah, no, I don't think there's any taking it back. I mean, I, I think whether, again, I think he was at the right place. And in fact, Tim's book talks about this to a degree that this has been set up for a long time of Republican voters feeling like they were sold out by the, by the establishment, whether it be in trade deals, whether it be in, in crony capitalism or what, whether it be in spending or cutting deals with Democrats or whatever the reason is. And so, no, this uh, go into Washington, say what you're going to do and shake it up. And, you know, the, the, there was a joke on the campaign, the difference between a Cruz voter and a, and a Trump voter in the primary was the, the Cruz would burn the Capitol down. Trump would burn the Capitol down, but he wouldn't let anybody out. And so that was like the, the, the big difference between the two. So, yeah, I think, no, I think that this is, by the way, again, this is voter driven. This is not politician driven. This is all voter. I mean, we don't go to the same restaurants. We don't go to the same. We don't watch the same theater. Go to the same theaters. Nobody goes to theaters anymore. But we don't watch the same Netflix shows. We don't want. I mean, we don't eat the same food. We don't go to the same schools. We don't live in the same areas. Like we have this drawn out, and it's voters doing it. It's not the politicians. The politicians are just there to kind of pull it and see. But. The, the voters are the ones that are moving further apart. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a value system and it's, there are all kinds of reasons why that would take another, you know, show to explore, but it, it's the voters that are moving apart. Literally. I, I, and, don't, I, and you don't think that we have leaders that are capable of turning the voters in a different direction. Yeah. Um, um, I think it'd be very difficult to, to go uh, to turn around the trends that are happening in politics and the geopolitical forces that are at work that are driven a lot by race, a lot by income, a lot by geography. I don't know how you go to a, to a, um, you know, the, the, the math here is just overwhelming. If you go into a, a lower income area of, of, of your community, where people, the average income is $17,000 for a, for an African American family of four. I don't know how you're turning that around. And I don't know when the same, when the same, when that, when the, the, the ascent up the economic ladder is so difficult these days on top of the pandemic, on top of everything else that's happened. I think it's very hard to reverse some of these trends. Mike, you got a question? I was going to say, so, I mean, I'd be interested. So you following all these data and everything, if you look at, at America 10 years from now, so not the election 148 days, but like, what is, what do our politics look like in a decade? It, are they just more nasty, more divisive, more, I mean, what, what, what do you see happening? Well, first of all, it's been pretty tough for a long time. We had a duel on the Senate floor, you know, I mean, that's a pretty weird. There's nothing one. new yeah. under the sun. It'd be, yeah, it'd be hard to see that happen on C-SPAN. Um, I think there's ebbs and flows of all these moments. And there's certainly times that you can see um, even, even, you know, even now, not right now, but in, in this modern age that, that, that voters come together on big issues. They agree on a lot of things. They agree on term limits. They agree on balanced budgets. They agree on, I mean, there's a, there's a convention of states movement that talks about all the things that, you know, 70% of the, of the electorate agrees on. So I think there's a lot of that there, but I think it's going to have to be started and continued with the first couple hundred days of an administration to really bring that to bear. But, but the, you know, I mean, these guys just spent, think in mind, in, in a way, COVID-19 brought a lot together. They spent $6 trillion dollars in the span of about 35 days. Now, 4 trillion of that was through the Fed, uh, and, but 2.4, and, and I, 
you know, who knows what we're going to do with city and state bailout or not. But I mean, these guys spent trillions of dollars by voice vote. Now, if that's not coming together, I don't know what is. They used to fight about a highway bill because it was 515 million versus, you know, 350 million. So I, there are times and there are moments and there are, there are the, who can predict, you know, the things that, that will happen. But yeah, I, politics is always going to be pretty tough because people just frankly don't agree. And it's okay that they don't agree. And it's big, heavy, weighty issues that they disagree on. And that ought to be, that ought to be kind of fought out pretty hard, to be honest, because it's a big impact on people's lives. Okay, uh, Adam, what do you got? Some questions. We're, we're coming in for landing shortly, so let's, you might want to throw a couple together and uh, see whether we can't get short answers from Jeff and short, answers, short comments from the, the interviewers as we're moving along. Go ahead. Sure, this one seems a little shorter. Um, who do you see as maybe a future star of the Republican Party after Trump, whether it's 2020 if he loses this one or 24 and he just terms out? Is there anybody you see being a, a, someone who's, who's up and coming that could run in 2024? Yeah, I think if, if Trump, if the president loses, you'll have a, a there's going to be a wide open, huge field because everybody believes Biden will be beat. And uh, I think you'll have, you know, let's just say all the ones under 60 years old that ran last time, they'll probably all run again. And then you have new stars on the field like the, the DeSantis's in Florida and the Ducey's in Arizona and the Reynolds in Iowa, the Abbott's in Texas, governors. I think governors will probably make a comeback from their performance in 16. Uh, governors, you know, one of the best things that's happened about the pandemic, all, you know, all, all uh, qualifiers aside, is the people understand that it matters who they elect. And so turnouts up and governors are more popular, mayors are more popular and, and more known. So I think you'll see some stars on our side come out of the governors, a great slate of governors that, that, uh, that would run. We lost you, Alan. I think you're on. There you go. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask you, which is a very unfair question, but I got you, so I'm going to do it. Uh, yeah. So if you had a, if someone put a gun to your head and said, okay, Jeff, how is the presidential election going to turn out in terms of what numbers you see coming out and what's the Senate going to look like? Uh, what would, you know, we're all going to write it down. We're going to invite you back afterwards and we can talk about what actually happened. Twitter will be full of it. I got it. Um, so I think we're probably looking at a, um, if, 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 so it depends on the campaign, but, but what I, what I see is a close election. Um, and let, and, and by the way, I've, if I had to bet, I'd bet on Trump. I would have a hard time betting against him. Um, but I think these states that you look at where he's in play when other Republicans aren't the states that he can win that nobody else can, I think those are very critical for him. I think the, the, um, the Biden campaign and how he performs, I, mean, I can't imagine. I watched every Democrat debate, every second of every Democrat debate, and I cannot see that guy debating the president. I just, I can't, I can't see it. Um, I can't see it in him holding his own. So the uh, the Senate follows along those lines. I mean, it used to be about Susan Collins used to be able to run 15 points ahead of George W. Bush in Maine because of her strength in those states. I mean, the range now is about five, maybe six. And so as the presidential race go, the Senate race will go. Now, we're, we're going to spend a couple hundred million bucks trying to buck a trend in Colorado and buck a trend in Arizona potentially and, you know, you know, reinvest in some states that are ours to make sure our incumbents are safe. But the, it, the two will go – will not track solely together. I mean, Democrats are going to lose a seat in Alabama, in my opinion, with my candidate, Tommy Tuberville. Um, so they're already starting down once. Now they got to win four back. It's pretty hard. You, you got to reach right now. They're all in play. There's seven seats in play in a real way. And so today, you know, again, the darkest day of the political calendar so far, they're all in play. But I think that, I think that at the end of the day, it'll be a very close election. The Senate will be, be decided probably in two or three States as will the presidential. Okay. Let me just sort of say, well, you and I should bet a bottle of very good scotch. Exactly. There we go. Because I think it's, I, because I'm willing, I'm willing to take take the other side on that thing. Mike, you got yeah. something? Did you finish your scots that you want to add? Yeah, I timed this. I timed this perfectly. No, I was honestly just thinking a uh, from this is my personal opinion here, but a Trump Biden debate I think is punishment for some sort of sins that we've had. Because good lord, that's going to be <laughs> miserable. But um, no, I mean I. I, I'm interested in you. You identified what some of those states are going to be, um, and and the, the house races that are in there. But are there certain indicators like people who are interested in this 
in the next month, in the next two months? Like what yeah. are some of those numbers? Like, are there certain things you're going to be looking for to know how the trend's going? Yeah. Big, yeah. Good question. So first of all, the movement from a healthcare crisis to an economic crisis with the pandemic, those I've been tracking those, you know, after a couple of weeks in and uh, they're slowly moving. Republicans now, now are about 78% call it an economic crisis instead of healthcare. Democrats are up to 40% call it an economic crisis instead of a, instead of a, uh, economic crisis. And so, you know, as those numbers start to shift, I mean, for us, for Republicans, we need, we need this to be an economic issue, an economic campaign, a, a, a campaign based on the economy. And not, by the way, not the Dow Jones, but jobs and the availability of, of good paying jobs. As that, if that becomes a central issue of the campaign, that's going to help everybody. And the way that that becomes a central issue of the campaign is that COVID is processed through the system you know, and, and people don't view it as, 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 um, as their livelihoods are at stake and their life, in fact, of them and their loved ones are at stake. If that washes out, does it come back in the fall and all those kind of things will be a key question. We ask it on every survey now is what do you think? Do you think it's an economic crisis or a healthcare crisis? And I think that will probably be the biggest driver because Democrats always went on healthcare. I think, I think Biden's got like a 17 point lead on healthcare. If they believe it's a healthcare election, we got to make like mask or no mask. We got to figure this out, um, and we got to like maybe go into the bunker again for seventy days. I mean that obviously impacts everything. But as this becomes more of an economic issue and an economic campaign, that's something we track all the time. And the better, the more it becomes economic, the better Republican opportunities are. Okay, my uh, Adam, what do you got in way of a question for us? We're getting near the end here. Yeah, we probably have a little bit of time. Um, this one, one of the things that has maybe in the past been talked about more, but, but hasn't been talked about so recently, um, do you think either party will become more hawkish on deficits as that as we move forward, especially given the uh, economic situation of the last year? No. <laughs> no. Um, there's a bigger gulf between the country as a whole and politicians than there is between Republicans and Democrats. The one thing both sides can agree on is to spend money. Okay, and so, what's that? I was gonna say, I was gonna just move, just shift you over for a moment, if I can, and that is, what's happened in the last 10 days since the murder of George Floyd? Yep. Uh, and, the, and what we've seen, you know, and, and I'm older than you are, and I remember uh, when people compare it to what happened in the 60s, I would say to them, they're absolutely wrong for any number of reasons. Uh, my question to you is, what do the, how do the Republicans respond to what we're seeing out there, assuming that, you know, the level of destruction, which seems to have sort of waned, and basically it seemed to have been more uh, episodic than sort of uh, organic, uh, how do they deal with this, especially as this continues to move forward and, and their numbers among among African Americans are just so so awful politically. Yeah, I think there's a uh, there's the underlying issue that everyone has to confront is that as a white kid growing up in Brookfield, Missouri, I never had to worry about a cop roughing me up or killing me. That never, never even would have crossed my mind, and my entire life that's never even crossed my mind. And and it's very clear not just with this instance, but with instances around the country, that that's in the front of a lot of, of, a lot of African-Americans' um, mind. And so that has to be addressed. Now, in a way that it's addressed, and the political fight that comes out of that, whether it be defunding the police and go to a community policing model, or there's some, I was you know, reading some, some journals on that and how that would, how would that would confront. I mean, there's a, it's, it's a, um, Republicans will not, be able to go as far as, as a lot of the activists would like them to go because we are, um, we're, we're going to be very conservative and cautious on making major police changes. So you either believe that it's a, it's a minority of police that are bad, or you believe that they're all involved in systematic racism. And that's a big, heady question that people a lot smarter than political hack like me are going to have to sort out. You also have, activists who have been yearning for change for a long time appropriately, but yet some of a minority of the protesters went bananas and looted and destroyed major sectors of their own cities. And so neither side, of course, has a, 
has the uh, the upper hand in this. And I, I think, man, I wish this didn't happen on the heels of a pandemic when so many people lost their careers and lives, literally lives and their careers and their businesses gone to not come back in the same meaningful way. And, and I wish this, this didn't happen within 200 days of an election because there will have to be healing that comes out of it. There'll have to be appropriateness and, and measured response that comes as a result of it. But to, 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 um, to keep the police from doing their job, which is to keep us safe and to not address it are both incompatible. Those are incompatible positions. We have to keep ourselves safe and we have to do it appropriately. And I hope if anything comes out of it, we know the names of people that have, that have either been killed, maimed, or seriously hurt because of police brutality. And this is going to be one of those moments of the, the public viewing was today in Houston and the Republican governor attended and, and the senator, both senators in Texas have, have uh, communicated with the families. I mean, this is a time for all of us that the politics, you know, in many respects, not for me, I do this for a profession and I do this for a living, but a lot of people are like, Hey, let's just like take a break here for a little bit and sort this out calmly together. And that's hard when we're up, uh, you know, 150 days out and things are as sideways as they are. Where Republicans will land on that, I think, unfortunately, will probably be against, you know, super, you know, supercharged positions for the police. The police put their life, their life on the line every single day. They are also murdered. I mean, they, we can't just leave them defenseless, uh, but they also can't be doing the things that have happened. So I hope that I hope they'll sort out. I'm a hack, and so I run campaigns, so I'm not smart enough to figure it out. But there will be systematic change out of this and Republicans will be a part and parcel of that because they are the governors. There's, there's only one major city that has a Republican mayor. So the mayors will lead a big chunk of this. But as far as government and funding and, and governors, they'll be on the front edge. Yeah, no, it seems to me, and I'm going to, Adam, I want to go to you for another question in just a second. But I think one of the questions I think that we all kind of sit watching what's happened in the last 10 days, the question that I keep asking people is, uh, would this have happened if the uh, Mr. Floyd had been white? And I think everyone that I've talked to, to w no matter what their political background, agrees that no, it wouldn't have. That if he were a white man, he'd probably be alive today. And that says so much for, to all of us. And I just think that that is a political that that I, that theme is there because it doesn't seems to me it doesn't matter with how conservative or liberal you are. Uh, a lot of good human, I think most Americans are good human beings and they're just certain things that really bother them. And this is one of them. Yeah. Well, I think, and by the way, just so I can throw this in as a plug, I mean, that's why your organization to a degree exists where these platforms can be discussed. I know as a white guy from Brookfield, Missouri, I just spoke for about two minutes on race and I was starting to get uncomfortable at the end of it that I was going to say something that would upset people. And so for those conversations to really occur and happen, we're going to have to lower our guard a little bit and have honest discussions about it because it's, it's hard. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that they find themselves in the same way when they talk about police and police activities. So it's a, uh, it's too bad it's happening right now, not just the election, that'd be tough enough, but coming on what everybody just went through with, you know, three months of a, of a lockdowns, a very okay. difficult time. Thank you, Jeff. Adam, you got a final question from our audience. Yeah, one more. Um, so there, there's, as you said, you, Jeff, you believe this will be a very close election. There's a lot of swing states that, that are going to maybe decide this. Um, obviously, in 2016, there was a lot of talk, even by Trump himself, of things like voter fraud and maybe from the, from the left side of Russian influence or things like that. Do you think it's possible we're going to run into another uh, maybe Gore-Bush situation with the judiciary having to get involved or, or anything like that? And how would you see that playing out if it happens? For sure. For sure, that's going to happen. And there's a couple of reasons why. Big changes in, in the way people cast their ballots are slowly adopted. Kansas has had open, you know, early voting for a long time, and, and uh, they've gotten used to that process, and it's grown from, you know, 5% adoption to 50%, 60%, up to maybe even 70%. So they've slowly adopted people with behaviorally have adjusted. These states where they've not, and we just walked, went through it. I mean, we just had this a bunch of elections last week. We've got six states. My firm has six states are up on the ballot tomorrow. They have no clue. The election officials don't know how to do it. The voters don't know how to do it. You want to try and count every vote that you possibly can. We're still getting results from Pennsylvania because they adopted it like, like they did. Arizona, you don't find out the winner of, in Arizona until 
you know, 10 days after the election. I mean, these are really bad rules. And I don't mean early vote. I mean, I'm fine with early vote. Frankly, early vote's a little bit better for Republicans than Democrats. It's about 1.2% better. Um, so you would think that it'd be worse for us. And I'm not, I, I mean, again, I just live in data. So it's either good for you or bad for you. But So I don't, I don't care what the rules are. But I care that the election re- officials and the process is set up that we can understand who wins elections on election night. And that is not the case. And there will be so many votes cast provisionally now. And provisionally means you're going to a, you know, they, they offer completely complete different election authorities allow you to come in and vote even if you're not, if you're not from that area, which means you might be voting in congressional elections that are actually are across the line that you've crossed to go vote. It, it is going to be a complete circus on election night. And if it's close at all, we're not going to have any idea for several days. And that's, I mean, I watched the Iowa, you know, I, I was old enough during the, during the Florida recount to be involved, but I watched what happened to the Democrats and what ha- frankly, what happened to Pete Buttigieg, what happened to him in Iowa, stole an election from the guy. Didn't even steal it, just like the momentum that comes from and everything else. And if we don't know who's going to be the president for 10 days, I think it's going to make all this look like child's play, what will play out. Well, that, you're going to get the final word there, Jeff. Uh, two things I want to say is, is that, you know, uh, uh, perhaps the, the margin of the election will be large enough that it really won't, we, we won't have to worry about it. And then we'll wait and see uh, yeah. how that works out. Uh, Mike McShane, thank you for joining me as a uh, uh, co-host here. And Jeff, uh, really want to thank you very, very much for uh, uh, giving us the time. And we will want to have you back when this election's over. And you can tell me why you make so much money as a political consultant. I should just listen to you and, and not give my opinion as, as, as an old retired guy. But uh, I'll be drinking your scotch. But, what's that? I'll be drinking your scotch. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I want you to, but I want to thank you very much. And uh, Adam, we got anything you want to close with? Yeah. Just a few last things. Once again, thank you to Alan and Mike for moderating this. And thank you very much to Jeff for bringing your insight and your experience to us. I'm sure I know, I know all of our audience appreciates it. Um, I just want to say if you enjoyed this program, uh, this Thursday on June 11th, we'll be having another Cocktails and Politics. It's featuring uh, Margaret Talev who is the White House correspondent for Bloomberg News and a CNN political analyst. She'll be talking about the media's role in the crises that we are facing right now. Uh, Also on June 16th will be the start of our three-part virtual series on mental health. It's called From Resistance to Resilience, the Mental Health of KC Residents. Uh, We'll explore the root causes of mental illness in our community and how we can find ways to meaningfully address them. Uh, The first program is on the topic of socioeconomic trauma. And again, that will be June 16th. Also, if you haven't listened to them yet, both uh, Ambassador Alan Katz and Mike McShane have a very good podcast uh, as part of our At The Square series. Uh, They talk about a lot of issues and have some great guests and they look at it from both sides of the political aisle. So all of those programs, you can learn more about them at our website, which is just AmericanPublicSquare.org. If you have any questions, please contact me through our contact form or through our various social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. Uh, Finally, of course, if you like what we do and you believe that these kind of conversations are important, um, please consider becoming a member of of American Public Square at Jewel. Uh, We are a nonprofit organization and your membership supports all of our programming and everything we do. And then, of course, once this event's over, you'll be sent a survey. Please just take one or two minutes to fill it out. It really helps us improve our programming and find out what the community wants and what we should be uh, talking about. Uh, Once again, I want to say thank you to Jeff for doing this, coming on our program. Uh, And from American Public Square at Jewel, I want to thank you for joining us. So, everybody, have a good evening. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thanks.